February or wait, no, March. We're in March and it is about 6, 16 PM. Comments, suggestions, petitions by residents and attendants regarding items not on the agenda. Okay, um, I see there's none, so I will move on to our discussion items. Zoning research and recommendations, issues and directions to the Westchester Planning Commission. So I believe that is me and Last month, I brought up that, you know, I, as a resident and, and running for council last year, I, I attended some meetings and I heard a lot of feedback from the residents with regards to some of the buildings that were going up in the, um, in the area. And um, just there are certain things that are coming up and coming up again. And so I thought, you know, Maybe what's happening is there's some gray area in our in our zoning code and our ordinances that could be looked at again and just to make sure that we're all on the same page and, and maybe there's more clarity so we can be in the spirit of what, you know, is the vision for Westchester. Uh, after I brought this up last meeting, you know, it came to me the, uh, the great idea from the mayor to go back to the planning commission and also pick their brains on what what they've been hearing along the way as kind of the hot topics. And so I did that and and Jim, is that you? Yes, I've been talking a lot with Jim. And and after my conversations with Jim and also Matt Clapp, you know, I've narrowed down to, in my opinion, some, some four hot topics that I would love the planning commission to, to look into in our codes and bring back recommendations of how we can close some of these gaps in interpretation for the future. The four that I've, that I've come to select that I think um, are the hottest topics after our conversations were uh, in the Saldo, more clarity to take a look at the open space fee and lieu piece of the Saldo. And, and are, there, are there gaps there for interpretation that could be looked at and, and um, closed? From the zoning ordinance, there were three topics that I thought could be looked at as well. The height requirements, how to measure buildings, um, the build two lines clarification on build two lines for our buildings and also the parking and how many spots are needed for for each unit based off of the, the building type. So, so those are four components that I thought were hot topics and I'd love for the planning commission to take a look at come back to us within the next month or or two with recommendations so we can move through the process of of really refining and, and closing those gaps. Very good. Any questions? I suggest we, um, the committee make a motion, make that recommendation to council and then council can take a vote and direct council as a whole can direct the planning commission to do that. Okay. Approved. Agree. I agree with myself. So that's right. Okay. Item number B. Regulations of Animals, Chapter 37, Article, Keeping of Poultry and Hogs. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Denise Polk, and I am here to um, appeal to you to consider um, perhaps having a Part B to the Poultry Ordinance. So um, I live at 218 West Biddle Street, and I have a big backyard for a borough backyard, but it's 21 feet wide, fence to fence, that's east to west, and over 100 feet long from the bottom of the steps to, of my desk all the way to the alley. And so the current ordinance says that you have to have 10 feet on either side of the property line. So 10 feet to my neighbor to the east and 10 feet to my neighbor to the west in a 21 feet property leaves me one foot in the middle of my yard to make a skyscraper like um, a coop and, and that really, I don't know how, how feasible that would be. So I'm not sure uh, whether you whether I was able to get this on time, but I can email it to you. I looked up online at hundreds of 
um, municipalities and their poultry ordinances. And many of them really don't apply at all. Um, 50 chickens and roosters are allowed and we're talking about more rural areas. But I did find um, a, a dozen or so, and I could find more that have um, ordinances like 50 feet from the neighbor's dwelling. Um, that's, a bit, that's a big one, um, 50 feet from the neighbor's dwelling. Sometimes uh, are 10 feet from any residence, five feet from the owner dwelling, and 50 feet from neighbor residence, 40 feet from houses, 20 feet from residence door or window, 30 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that this ordinance, the way that it is currently written, is very prohibitive for almost anybody who lives in a twin or in a row house, um, regardless of the ov overall square footage of their backyard. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there could be a consideration of the removal of that 10 foot from each property line um, and institute whatever distance from any house or residence that would be fine um, and then keep everything else the same. I would even suggest that it would be uh, reasonable if council were amenable to it instead of for people who do have those more narrow properties to further restrict the number of hens that that property owner could apply for, maybe make it three. Usually you don't want to go much less than three, definitely not one because they're flock animals and they would get depressed. Um, so this is a really well used and partially destroyed um, rendering of my backyard. So you can see as I was trying to put it to scale, um, I have it marked out um, where it's well over 100 feet in my backyard. Any questions? Uh, my one question to you is, do you have a specific recommendation that you'd like to make to council or the borough as to what those modifications should be? Uh, well, it would be to remove the 10 foot um, property line restriction and then um, anywhere between 30 to 50 feet from any re any residence. Um, I don't recall offhand. I know it's written there um, in the in the current code. So if you wanted to keep that the same or make it even a further distance um, because it's narrower, but everything else about, you know, using privacy fencing and things like that seems reasonable. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Thank Polk. You. Yes. Good evening. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. The, uh, I have a couple questions for you. Huh? Sure. I didn't realize, I read that thing four different ways and I didn't realize that all you were asking for is to, to uh, remove the 10 foot from either side. Uh, but the distance from the house, the, your neighbor's house, mm -hmm. uh, if it's 30 or 40 feet or wh whatever you just said it, wh what it was, mm -hmm. that would still prohibit you from having uh, chickens that close to the neighbors. Because well, it, most it, of the houses in the borough, mm -hmm. unless you live in the first ward, uh, are twins or attached. Mm -hmm. And most of our backyards are 20 feet wide mm -hmm. by 90 feet long. Mm -hmm. So uh, if my chickens went up on the patio, they'd be right next to the, uh, the neighbor's house. No, no, but I mean, I would, I would say for myself, I would be able to go further away from the house yep. and still not be within the, you know, I'd still be within the parameters of the next nearest neighboring residence across from the alley from me. Since so, we only have really two permits, I looked into it. Uh, we only have two permits that are alive right now uh, in the borough, your one, and I don't know who the other one is, but the, uh, what does the Humane Society say as far as ground coverage for chickens? How, how much land do they, like for a horse, I think you need an acre and a half Right. How much ground do you need for for the chickens uh, to be in a given area? 
I don't remember off the top of my head, but I know that the current ordinance, the way that it is written, is um, more generous than other ones in terms of allowing them more space for their living area. So the the current the current standards for what the coop and the um, the chicken run would be um, seem very reasonable. They're, and they're then they're more generous than many other m municipalities the way that our code has it written right now. The other the other chickens just FYI are on the other end of Lafayette Street. I mean, Washington. So they're on your same street. Pardon me. Other chickens yes. in the borough yeah. to Mr. Flynn, they're on Washington Street. That used well, that used to be my neighbors. And um I don't have and I was taking care of the chickens there. He became a vegan and so on and so forth and didn't really want them on his property anymore. So um Otherwise, I would still be keeping chickens on on his property, but so now I'm seeking to do it on my property so that I, I am able to maintain control over that. It was very convenient because it was right across the alley, but. Chair, what did we do? I mean, the 10 foot to me makes sense because if you only have a 1 foot down the center, uh, you know, where do we go? I, I think Sean is going to tell us what the process might be. Well, yeah, you would have to do an ordinance amendment to change the setback requirements, but in your zoning code, you have a setback requirement in most of your districts of five feet from side yards. Um, the 10 foot restriction for this particular use is a de facto exclusion from areas in the borough that have narrow lots. So council should consider that and the impact of lowering the side yard setback requirements because you would invite those uses into districts they can't be in right now, like uh, the property Ms. Polk just talked about. So that's those are the issues for council to consider. It, it You are already allowing accessory structures within five feet of property lines, but but you would be allowing uh, chicken coops in a lot more places than you, you currently can in the borough if you went to five feet. So do you think we should allow the new zoning officer to work on that once they're on board? We could uh, do that, bring that back to the committee in April. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, what is our vote here? Like, just to take it back to. Uh, All right. All right, now we're on to the action items. Okay, so these are the ones that we'll talk about. Um, motion to approve final land development plans, 330 West Market Street. Certainly. Good evening. Uh, Brian Nagel on behalf of the applicant. Uh, uh, as you said, the, this is the um, um, application for final land development approval for this project. It's the redevelopment of the, um, the, the block where Mitch's gym is. Uh, this received preliminary land development approval from Borough Council uh, at the end of last year. And we filed the final land development application. It did receive a recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission during preliminary. Um, we were in front of the Planning Commission for the final land development approval, and there was a there was an issue, a question about the height of the building. Um, I can exp I can go through that. We've since clarified that it's, that's not an issue. Um, all the other issues have been resolved, with the exception of um, the rec fee issue, which is the other open issue that needs to be resolved. Otherwise, the project is ready for final land development approval. So if, you, if you'd like, I can talk about the height issue and, and kind of what happened there, um, go over a few points. Yeah, sure, yeah.
So we had a question about the height when we were in front of the planning commission. We submitted um, the the 11 by 17 that you see um, that, that basically explains how the height is calculated for the building. It's it's two buildings. It's That's how it was set up when it was submitted, building A and building B. And we have the architect, Neil Liebman, here, and he can go through the calculations for you, how it's done under the ordinance. Uh, but essentially, you can see um, if you calculate the height of building A, you take you go around the building and you measure it vertically under the terms of the, the definition of height to the highest point of the flat roof. So for building A, you can see the different points where they've taken the measurement. They put those over in their table. And obviously, um, everything's based on sea level. So if you look at, for example, H13A, where it says 429, that's grade at that point in the building, uh, at that side of the building. That's the grade there. So that's 429 feet above sea level. And then you would measure from that point under the terms of the definition, you measure vertically to the highest point of the roof. In this case, the architect used 489. That's the, this, this is a flat roof. It has a slight pitch to it to allow water to move, obviously when it rains. And so th there, may, there may be a slight change in the, in the grade. They've used the highest point. Uh, it's, only, it's only a matter of probably a few inches to get the water off, but essentially, the highest point of that would be the 489. So it's a conservative calculation in that they use the 489 for all of the, the measurements around building A. Same thing with building B. They move them over to the chart. Building A comes out at 58.73. Building B comes out at 54.42. And the, I think the concern from some of the planning commission members was, well, that's, it's, it's not two buildings, it's one building. It is two buildings. That's how it was submitted from a from a building code perspective. It's two building. So that's the proper way to do the height calculation. That being said, even if you calculate it as one building under the terms of the ordinance, and I'll I'll refer back to we had a recent application for the redevelopment of the of the Burger King site. And some of you will remember that. And and the height issue came up there. The zoning officer weighed in on that and signed off on the, the calculation here. Then it went in front of council, and council also agreed with that and approved that. Um, the calculation you see here compares essentially what the, what, what, what one member of the planning commission came up with versus how you would calculate it in terms of how we did it for the, for the Burger King. So in, in that instance, you're, he was measuring essentially to the highest point of the other, the other building, building A in this case, which is not an appropriate way to do it, even if it were one building. And that's been, that, that issue was reviewed and determined by the zoning officer, by council in the other project. So even if you use that as one building, it still comes out to 56.7 feet. So under either analysis, and again, the proper way to do it for this building, because it is two buildings, is the A and B methodology that you see here. But even if you even if you calculate it as one building, it still falls under. And I'll give you an example that's important to understand. You could take this building, if you look at, I'll just I'll just point to, to this exhibit here. If you look at this exhibit, building A, you could lower it by like 1.7 feet, I think it is. And you could raise building B by 11 and a half feet and run the calculation the way that the planning commission member suggested you run it. And that would be a compliant building. It would be a much bigger building, probably be able to fit almost another 20 units in there. And obviously, 11, 11 and a half additional feet on the building B side would be um, a significant impact in terms of the massing of the building and how it would be perceived. So that would be fully compliant even with that calculation. So I would submit to you that, uh, that we do meet the, the, the height regulations um, and that the, the application should be approved. And Neil, is there anything that you think you could address further that I haven't covered? I don't we'll cover, but uh, just wanna go back to the original. Introduce, introduce yourself. Sure, uh, I'm Neil Liebman, I'm with Bernardin, we're the architects for the project. Um, and I've been involved with many of the projects that uh, Mr. Khan has done in this borough. Uh, throughout the years and 
had other opportunities to do height calculations and parking calculations and all the things that you mentioned earlier. So very familiar with those. Um, from the onset of the design of this project, the one thing that, um, that Mr. Nagel didn't mention is that we purposely designed this building as two buildings to step it because the street slopes significantly along that portion of, um, uh, excuse me, of, of um, Market Street, um, the site slopes about 12 feet from all the way up at the far, if you're looking at it from the, from the street, looking back from the far left to the far right or closer to Potter, all the way down to South Wayne, there's about a 12 foot drop in the site. So we have this natural topography there that we're working with. That's why the building was stepped to begin with, because we knew that we didn't want to take the building straight across be more obtrusive or more larger on, on South Wayne where you have more residents. This is more, I, in my opinion, it's better suited for for South Wayne and how it's done. As Mr. Nagel said, there are things that we can manipulate on the building and drop it a foot and a half, 1.6 is, I think six inches is what, I believe somebody said 1.6 inches is what they said that they, they didn't agree with our calculations by 1.6 inches. We could take this building straight across the whole length of that building and lower the building 1.6 inches. So I think this is the best solution. And we also believe that it meets the intent and the uh, definitions of the ordinance. Um, no, I was just, if, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, just the other, the other open issue is, is the rec fee. And I submitted correspondence. Mr. Nagel, I do have a question for yeah, that with the height. Please. How do you come up with a hypothetical? You said sea level. I mean, how do you? I live in that alley. Okay. So my house well, is there, right? <laughs> right. So uh, do you measure from the existing grass and con uh, blacktop up? Or do you go from the footers or the, gar the garage, whatever? So all the heights are measured from the finished grade. So that would be from the grass or from the sidewalk, whichever is there. So, um, and uh, Joe did all the civil work, did all the survey work, and he provides all the, um, the topography along the, along the property. Each of the, every point of the topography, you look at the civil drawings, is all based on a sea level elevation. So that every point that you see in this chart, even in the one that's in white or the one that's in green, that's the sea level elevation at that point above sea level. And everything then, if you look at the second column, either in the white or in the green, you see that it's 489. So we, we, when we build this building with the sections that we did shows a, how big we are from that point up. So it how, it's how we measure the vertical distance. I was just wondering how the elevations work, you know, from, from the driveway up. From the driveway, yes. Okay, because sea level doesn't make sense to me. Again, you know, <laughs> that's just your, that's really just your that's, starting. That's point. your datum. Right. It's a it's a datum point. It's just a, a snapshot in time, so you can measure this. So, if you look at all the far right column and the white and the far right column and the green, those are all the actual measured heights. Okay, along each of those points. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I, I do have a couple of questions on the height conversation. Um, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that our zoning officer did not make a recommendation here nor there with regards to the height of this building when they wrote up the the review back when the preliminary there. letter in the the plan the zoning officer letter during preliminary plan review stayed in effect the building height would need to be compliant with the section of the code. It did not make a determination. Typically, the zoning officer would add that determination at the at this stage in the game. Yep. Sure All right. can I, can I, I got it. Okay. So, so my understanding is that we should probably have the zoning officer right now. We haven't had any measurements on our side. It's all been on the building and the architect side, and it would make more sense for us to, to do our own zoning review of the height of the building before we move forward with any approval or disapproval of, of the height. Especially in light of the fact that you mentioned the high street um, building, and right now I believe there's a lawsuit that's also fo focused from the residents based off the height measurements and how they're measured. Yeah, I, I, I would make I would make two points on that. The, the the first is that determination was already made by the borough that this height complies with the ordinance, 
So you have to treat the applicants the same, number one. Number two, the zoning officer did make a determination as to this application. My client's team met with the zoning officer prior to filing this application and spending the hundreds of thousands of dollars to go through this process. And the zoning officer looked at the calculations that were done by Mr. Liebman's office and said, yes, this complies with our height regulation. So that did, that did happen. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a paper trail of that. We only have the memo that we have or the, what was written up already that doesn't state that. That's kind of the concerning, you know, or unfortunately, we just don't have that information. That's that's what happened in in fact, and Mr. Lieben could verify that. It, uh, Mr. Gore would verify that if you asked him. So I, I I don't think you can go backwards at this point because that was reviewed and wasn't raised. It's it's been two buildings as it was applied for originally, and so this late in the game, my opinion is it's definitely too late to go back and do that now. Certainly, council can seek whatever input at once, um, but the the application is up for final land development approval. Council is obliged to, to approve final land development approval. If you want to make a determination on the height, you can do that. And if you say, no, we like the other calculation, we disagree with this calculation, and then the, the 1.7 feet will be dropped and the 11 feet will come up and it'll be just a straight building all across and a more massive building, that you can make that determination and my client will have to deal with that. We don't think that's the best way to build this building, but council does have to act on the application. And because council granted preliminary land development approval, as long as nothing's changed with the plan, which it hasn't, then council's obligated to approve the final land development approval. That's the law. Sean, by any chance, have you and uh, the solicitor looked at the height uh, calculations and made a preliminary decision on the, the acceptance or rejection? We've been talking nearly every day since the planning commission met about this issue, and I believe there was a memo sent to council on this as well. So I think uh, what would be advisable would be for us to provide the committee and, the re and council with more information this week so that we're prepared when we get back in the room on Tuesday to discuss this issue that we have the right exhibits drafted and we have a determination made by uh, either the solicitor or the zoning officer on whether it's comply it's com complies with the the zoning code on this particular item okay so what basically what we're doing is we're we're, uh, we're going to delay the decision on the height or, or uh, of this until uh, your your team meets with uh, uh, the zoning officer and the solicitor. Yeah, I think you need some more information before we talk, before the full council, the committee doesn't make the decision to approve the, the plan, right. the full council does. We recommend, make yeah, a recommendation. Push on. Yeah, okay. Okay, so. Just try, I'm trying to understand, so we're making a recommendation for the discussion next week, given all of the outstanding items we we need to review okay okay all right so continue on with the uh the other topic that you wanted to bring up yes the other the other issue is the is the recreation we've provided our position on that previously um the borough the borough code asks for um, recreation facilities on the ground level it provides in the subdivision land development ordinance that if you can't provide that, you can provide it in a courtyard as a public space. We've done that. We had a discussion during preliminary um, and we're, we're requested to make an offer of dedication for some ground level space in addition to the courtyards that are on, uh, within the building for the residents. We've made that offer of dedication. I submitted a letter um, to, your, to the acting solicitor for this matter making that offer and the planning commission uh, issued you a recommendation that you not accept that that open space it's along wallerton alley so essentially i would characterize their view of it as it will be there it'll be available to be open it'll be but it'll be maintained by the applicant and i think the planning commission's unanimous perspective on it was that space is better 
to be maintained by the building owner than by the borough. And nevertheless, it will be there and available. It's right on the alley. Um, so council will have to decide if it wants to follow the planning commission's recommendation to accept that offer of dedication or not. It's a, council will just have to decide that issue. I would say the planning commission's recommendation on that issue made sense. I, 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 since I live on the alley and I did speak as an individual in front of uh, the planning commission, I totally agree that the best that the, the applicant keeps control of the, the property because, uh, because of the trees, the grass, the ivy, and it, the borough is not in a position to care for that space. And if we have a problem, it's a lot easier calling the owner and get the owner to fix the, a mess and pick up the trash than it would be have the borough go out and take care of it. I concur with that. Yeah, I concur with planning commission. And, 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 and back to one of your earlier discussion items about some gray area in the ordinance, this section of your ordinance definitely has some gray area and could use some cleaning up. That's uh, why it's on the list. <laughs> but, but my, and I, I will share this. We have, I think, th three times the required recreation space available in the courtyard for the residents of the building. So the, in addition to this other space that we offer dedication of, um, and so we've met it in spades. That being said, my client did agree to make a voluntary contribution of $40,000 to go towards Horace Pippin Park, which is something that came up during preliminary. So I our position is we've met the ordinance. We've, my client has come to the table with this voluntary contribution for Horace Pippen, and we're there on that issue. That would be our position. And, and Jim's shaking his head yes too. So I'll, yeah, the, I'll go the, with <laughs> here's here's the biggest confusing part about public space, and the mayor spoke to this a while back. <clears throat> and we all don't really understand public space because what we believe the public space to be is that Mrs. Murphy that lives over on Price Street should be able to go into the public space and be able to use it, where uh, in essence, she can't use it because it's in a courtyard on a privately locked space. So uh, to the chairman, the chairperson's uh, position, that needs, the wording needs to be like straightened out because it's extremely confusing to the local people that, you know, I'm going to pick the lock and go swimming because it's in my backyard, but it's not public space. It's private space for the public that lives in the building. And I think if you read, I think if you read, I understand that issue and I agree with you. And I think if you read the ordinance, it's not really clear what, what it's trying to have you do. However, in this case, there is a section in there that very clearly says it wants you to provide recreation space for the residents of the building to take pressure off of the of our public parks. And so in this case, you have the courtyards, which are three times the required, more than three times the required size. You have the space along Wallerton Alley, and those aren't available to the public, but to the residents of the building they are. You have all of the recreational facilities inside the building, the workout areas and things like that, in addition to that, that provide more space for the residents of the building. And then, based on the discussion we had during preliminary, you have this space along Wallerton Alley, which in and of itself, I think it's maybe 200 square feet short of the required space. And then there's a public art space around the corner from that. So we've met it in spades in this case. In other cases, apartment developers haven't been required to make a fee in lieu, pay a fee of lieu where they have these courtyards, even where they have no space outside that can be accessed, like you said, Mr. Flynn, from the street by anybody. In this case, we do have that. Um, Mr. Kamita issued a letter saying he doesn't think it meets the intent of what's meant to be a public space, but in the borough, in these tight spaces, as you all know, as residents of the borough, all these spaces get utilized for people walking walking through town and 
and so forth. And my client created probably one of the best privately owned, I'd say the best privately owned public space in the borough at 44 West. So my client knows how to do this. They provided for it in this case. And so I, I would ask that you recommend that we're clear on that issue. And I would also ask that you recommend approval of the um, final land development plan subject to a discussion on the height issue. I, I understand you want to look at the information being provided by your solicitor, or by your manager in advance of next week's meeting. I, I get that, but I would, I would ask in fairness, since my client is entitled to final approval, and that really is the only issue, I would ask that your recommendation be to approve final land development subject to your reviewing the height information and then also including the recommend recommendation that we have satisfied the recreation requirements. Just, just a point of information, uh, council is neither obligated nor is the applicant entitled to approval. Um, that's the discretion of the uh, legislative body of the borough to grant approval. You are obligated to act within the time frame of those approvals. So that's why we're a little under the gun to get this done. I, I'll speak frankly, I think that the committee's at a disadvantage here because you have experienced legal counsel in the room and you don't have your legal counsel in the room. So I would advise you to uh, get that counsel and get that information and be prepared for the next conversation you have. Yeah, I think, um, unless you want, I was saying, uh, I respectfully, even for the, the recreational space, I think it makes sense for us to just review all of it with our legal counsel, since we're planning on doing that, and then we can come back to you. But I don't think that we should make a recommendation here tonight on anything at this point. We can wait until we talk to our legal counsel. I agree. I disagree because I think that um, we, the, the fact that we, we could give a preliminary uh, recommendation to move forward uh, with, the, uh, with the exception of the height. And if our people don't agree that the height is incorrect, uh, you have to adjust your height requirements for the for the project. We, but the the the, re the fee and lieu that that's pretty clear uh, of what we're doing for this building. But as far as the height requirement, um, uh, that's still the 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 appendage to hold on to the fact that it's 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 not a. a, a a good rec a full recommendation, so it's going to be two to one, but the, the fact is, is uh, you, you have a shot at getting a clarification on Tuesday, correct? Yeah, and I, and, and, and I, I would ask Mr. Metric that you have your solicitor look at what I was referring to. I do not believe that that's correct, that council has discretion. If our plan is the same and we've already received preliminary land development approval, the law is the council is obligated to approve it unless there was some change in the plan and there ha there hasn't been. So I would ask I would ask that you just give your solicitor a heads up at that issue because I don't think what you're saying is accurate under Pennsylvania law respectfully. I I think we are 2 to 1 where we have our our decision for tonight and we'll and that we'll get back to it and move to the next agenda item. Thank you. Motion to approve proposed mural at 319 West Gay Street with recommendation of Westchester Public uh, Arts Commission. You all may be familiar with this uh, location. It's on the side of a business on uh, the Hannam Avenue parking lot. And the Public Arts Commission, part of its responsibilities are to review applications for public art and make recommendations to council for approval. So they met, reviewed this, and recommend approval. The thing I always like to make sure of when public art is introduced, that it's not a de facto advertisement for the business that is painting the mural, and it's not. So yeah, looks looks pretty nice, too. Any questions? Uh, no. well, we it'll, like it. It'll dress up that wall. Yeah, it'll look, it'll look, it'll look nice. Yeah, that was an easy one. All right. Can, 
C, consider solicitor attendance for zoning appeal 1007 of 1 South Brandywine Street seeks a special exemption to operate a child daycare center pursuant to section 112.304.D.3. So I will uh, tee this up for the committee, if you don't mind. The um, applicant submitted this, uh, and we are required to hold a zoning hearing. That zoning hearing is going to take place uh, April 8th, and our zoning officer will be there. They are currently doing a review and analysis of the application. Uh, it wasn't ready in time for tonight's meeting. Um, the applicant is proposing to put a child care care center with no more than 10 kids and two employees in an accessory structure on the property. It's a twin property located at the corner of West Market Street and South Brandywine Avenue in the um, town center district and um, excuse me, the NC2 district. Um, having looked at this and seeing that there are some issues that we need to uh, think about, you know, parking in the area B, um, pick up and drop off. There's a play area contemplated in the front yard, a sloped area. Um, they will have to obtain a valid certificate from PA uh, from Pennsylvania to operate the child care facility. Um, and we do have some questions about wh whether the building, the current building is occupied there. The, there is a residential building on the pop property as well. All that to say, I think the committee should have legal representation at this zoning hearing as we go through this so we can attach conditions of approval if necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Go Bernie. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I don't know whether the the solicitor for the applicant is going to do a presentation, or should we make a comment first, Mr. Metric? Good evening, members of council. My name is Ryan Jennings. I'm with the law firm Unruh Turner, Burke and Fries. I'm joined this evening by Shannon Mandine, who is one of two applicants along with her husband, Chris, uh, for the property at what at 1 South Brandywine uh, Street, as Mr. Metric has indicated. I just wanna put a little more context on the nature of this application. Um, the accessory structure, we'll call it, is not presently occupied. Uh, we did have an opportunity to meet with Mr. Gore prior to his departure in January, and we had a very, productive conversation at that time. Um, that accessory structure, which we're now looking to use to occupy the daycare center, again, with no more than 10 children, no more than two employees, will be state licensed as your daycare center use is defined in the borough ordinance. Um, it is a an existing nonconformity um, of which the commercial nature of that structure has not been abandoned. Um, it used to be Owens Printing. Before that, it was a daycare use itself. Um, so there are a number of, of commercial uses that that property, uh, specifically that particular structure, has experienced. Um, there, there's been some, some chatter. I know that there are some neighbors present, and we appreciate uh, their public participation here. The, the themes that I keep hearing are concerns over a, a dumpster, um, and that's given a, a that's because of a designation on the Howell engineering plan that does say new trash um, trash pad. And, and that is not a dumpster of any means. The daycare center use is not proposing to have a dumpster or any outdoor trash storage um, whatsoever. So we can we can kill that rumor right here, right now. Uh, I, know, I know another concern that was raised is this outdoor play yard. Um, Forest Pippin Park is just 400 feet from this property to the west. Um, that will be the outdoor recreation uh, that these 10 uh, children would utilize um, if utilizing an outdoor recreational space. Um, there will not, not be any actual outdoor play yard or playground per se uh, for this daycare use. Um, it will merely be a fenced in area. I would suggest that the, the characterization on our own plan um, is is misleading, and, and I apologize for that confusion for the public. But there will be no outdoor play space. There will be no no dumpster. 
Um, I think that we've put together a very comprehensive application, as you've probably seen if you've had an opportunity to page through. Not only have we performed a, an, an impact study as required, we've also done a traffic study because I know that there are legitimate concerns, um, preliminarily at least, about pick up and drop off and parking. All of those concerns have been addressed, um, have been addressed through the traffic study, will be presented um, through the course of our hearing. Uh, next month, April 8th. So um, we've put together, as I see it, a very comprehensive package. We don't have all the answers yet because we're just learning of some, some potential opposition, some potential concerns. Uh, what I would ask this evening of this council, um, the Smart Growth Committee, is not to necessarily send solicitor um, representation to the hearing for purposes of outright opposition. What I would instead ask for is to allow us the course of the next three to four weeks to continue dialogue, which we've begun previously with neighbors and had some more here tonight, um, so that we can continue to have productive dialogue, so that if there is a solicitor at that hearing, um, it's not necessarily to oppose, but instead to monitor the application, to monitor the hearing, and to ensure that appropriate conditions would be imposed if an approval would be granted. Uh, I've acted myself personally in that very capacity for this borough a handful of years ago. So I know how that process works. I know what reasonable safeguards can be implemented in a successful way, um, whereby this use, which I'll remind everyone, is permitted by special exception. It's lower than a variance standard. If we can check the boxes of the ordinance provisions, which we can through what I've already submitted, we are legally entitled, not to sound like Mr. Nagel, but we are legally entitled to an approval of that special exception relief. I wouldn't put this application forward before the council, before the zoning hearing board, if I didn't think that we could satisfy each and every one of that criteria. So with that, I'm happy to address any questions that council members may have. Uh, thank you. I, I'm sure Mr. Nagel will appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the, the shout out for, you know, for his, his uh, and Shannon, I was going to welcome you to the sixth ward, sweetest ward in the borough, but you are. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was going to welcome you to the the to my ward, but the uh, I was going to say I didn't see you at the polling place, but I understand. We've seen you a lot when you're applying for different things. No, she's in your ward right now, but well, now she's in mine. She's in both. Oh my God! She resides in Nicole's ward. Double vote, Frank yeah. Frank Rizzo. <laughs> uh, there you go. All right. Um, I have some really significant things that I want to talk about. And uh, because it, it's smack dab in the middle of the residential area in the sixth ward. The, uh, the dialogue that you talked about, Mr. Jennings, I wish that would have happened uh, prior to this evening with the residents in the, in the uh, apartment building, not the apartment building, the townhouses, uh, because... Uh, it's always good to have good neighbors, and uh, I sprung that this on them uh, over the weekend, and uh, to say that they got fired up, uh, they got fired up over it because no one talked to them. But here's here's my list of things that I saw there, and you've already corrected the play yard. The play yard on the plan clearly states that you're going to encroach on the side yard and build a elevated or a ground. You have to raise the ground somehow, either by wood or by dirt, to be able to be used off the off the uh, the doors. But you said that's not going to happen now. Correct. It'll so be that, that's incorrect. Merely a fence. All right. The biggest we have we have some serious issues. Be yes, please. ADA compliant entrance. Right. So there doesn't have to be a, a sidewalk there. Right. It has to be ADA compliant. But this is a ten child kindergarten age. We don't, it's not going to be a special needs. I don't know by law, we have to be ADA compliant. I don't know that that would ever be used. Yeah, the, uh, uh, and to, 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 to work on that, it would have to come from Market Street to the building because the back alley is a private dedicated alley, even though you have an easement for that alley, that's a private lane. Yeah. And, Sir, if I may, that sure. Person, so there's a loading and unloading zone directly in front of the buildings. Um, it's a curb cut there. Um, has been for a long time, as far as I know, 1977 at least. Um, and 
an ADA compliant could then they could unload there and then a wheelchair or similar device could go up the alley to that sidewalk and then go in the building there. That would be how it would work. And that way we wouldn't take up the entire front space with a ramp, which was what DL Howell warned us would happen is that entire green space in the front that we would like to re-landscape and make look nice. It's currently all green ivy. Um, it's it's terribly overgrown. We would re-landscape and, and put in, you know, something nice. Um, I haven't thought that far. Right. Uh, Just know that the alley's private and we understood. You're, you're permitted to use your take your car and put it into your garage, which you do not have. So uh, you really don't have access to the alley whatsoever. Okay. So even for the ramp, you can't be using that. I pulled the, that. We the uh, yeah. currently uh, that's a B zone for parking, and you have and uh, you have no parking or drop off zone that has to be approved by the borough and by uh, uh, parking authority. Uh, the playground you took care of. My main my main thing that I want you to understand is that used to be a offset printing building. And since I am in the chemical and paint industry and ink industry, uh, or the old offset uh, printing presses had used a lot of heavy solvents that had metal them to clean the, the typeset and to clean the circular tray that they put the lead-based ink on because back in the day in order to get brilliant colors it had to have lead in it to get the colors uh i mentioned to mr jennings that i'm concerned about core drillings in the building to see if there's any contamination in the soil uh, because i don't want any kids in the building if it migrates even though you can put tile over it carpet won't work but you have to make it a monolithic film but core drilling to make sure it's safe. And I think that's a good thing for you too, as well, because that building could be totally contaminated. It's intended to have an environmental inspection done for mold and, and other things. We're happy to do that, obviously, and ensure that, I mean, my own child would right. go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So obviously I want it to be safe. Sure. Um, it's a mature neighborhood and Current, you know, as you see over there, and there aren't very many children running around, even though the bus stops up the corner. Uh, and you have a couple of young kids on the corner. One's named after me. His first name's Flynn. I love the kid. The uh, uh, but it, it's a mature neighborhood, and the people that live in the townhouses and the elderly people who live down your block uh, will be disenfranchised uh, because. The, the noise and the activity will be totally different to what they're, they're used to right now, serenity. Um, 15 years ago, they had a daycare in the building. Our zoning officers shut it down because they didn't have proper zoning. And, uh, uh, and it, it does meet the criteria for special exemption if the zoning board agrees to, uh, to do something like that. The, the parking and the drop off of 10 kids, that's 10 cars, and you're not allowed to park on Market Street, that's a biggie, uh, because you don't have special parking there. And the, the noise uh, from daycare, the hours said from 6 to 7 p.m. So with, with that being said, you have uh, people talking, Living in this borough, everything echoes because of the way the buildings are. And I can listen to neighbors across the street what they're having for dinner if I'm sitting on the back porch because of the noise. And I think this is going to bring a lot of noise to that mature neighborhood. And uh, uh, respectfully, I believe, Mr. Jangs, that we should send the solicitor to object to the uh, the, the the opportunity uh the shannon's trying to put in the area thank you i understand um I, I would just say i you know that neighborhood better than anybody um there are a mix of various uses as i've 
stated in the addendum to the application. I mean, there are commercial uses across the street. There's uh, a Pico electrical substation, so there's utility uses. It, it, it is a mix, and, and I think that that's why legislatively the council members have allowed a daycare center use in this zoning district, which isn't encumbered by other overlays. So I, I understand and I respect your, your point. Um, I don't live there, you know best. Um, but there is a mix of uses there, and I do think that it's appropriately um, zoned, and I do think that a daycare center is appropriately uh, permissible subject to that special exception criteria. So, um, As you mentioned, the utilities across the street, they don't make any noise. Understood. Okay. The senior citizens that live across the street next to the utilities, they don't make any noise. I have five girls, one boy, and 14 grandkids. They make a lot of noise. So, uh, you know, it's early in the morning at six o'clock. You have seizure citizens living there. Uh, I think it'd be disruption to their lifestyle. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, we wouldn't um, have people, if the hours said six to 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., that wouldn't be accurate. Um, that wouldn't be what would be going in this building if approved. Those are the hours of operation that are permitted under the code. So that's what we put in our application. Those would not be the technical hours of operation for this specific use, but those are details that we can iron out and we'll present before the zoning hearing. Group. I mean, I do think we need to send the solicitor uh, to review this and represent the borough. I'd like to hear from the residents that are in attendance tonight um, and get their viewpoints. And to the residents that are going to speak, if I misspoke, it, it's what I observed and what I, I know. So if I misspoke something, please tell me. Sure. Uh, my name is Maddie Siegfried. Sean, it's nice to meet you. I wish we were meeting in different circumstances. <laughs> yes. So. I'm not trying to cut off that. Though. I had no idea that Glenn had, had told the neighbors, and if I had, I would have been. Well, I mean, I so just to to give me. Well, let me let me stop the bickering. I because of the agenda items, right? Uh, the agenda item council is responsible to review all our agenda items, and if something particular happens, like Miss Dorsey had chickens, I have a daycare. Miss Simone may have parking down in Greenfield. So we are very much in tune to angsts in our neighborhoods and to our neighbors. Uh, this is the first time Maddie Siegfried and I have seen each other ever. Yep. I never saw her at the polling place either, come to think about it. <laughs> but the, the fact is uh, uh, I reached out to her because the neighbors along Brandywine Street, there's an ongoing dispute over how people can get into their properties. And by law, they're allowed to use the private alley as an egress into their properties. So then uh, that was part of the consent for the, the building of the townhouses. So sure. th there's, there's no bickering that needs to be done. And, so. and, and listen, from my perspective as a borough council member, my role, our role is to hear all sides of the story and understand all components and everyone's input and make the best decision for our community as a whole, right? So we'll, we'll hear all the sides and we'll go through the information gathering and then we'll, we'll look into what the best solution is for our entire community. And so we, we let everyone provide their insight. Respect that. I, I would just say, I, I've already heard two council members are inclined to oppose and I'm not trying to silence the public. We want to hear from them. What I, what I want to do is potentially just hunt tonight and have an opportunity to have real dialogue offline with each and every of these neighbors that are interested. And we can reappear. I am willing to withdraw from tonight's agenda for purposes of having discussions and trying to see if we can resolve each and every of the concerns that they raise before we take a negative or in a vote of opposition forward. But that's not something that we're interested in doing. If we can't satisfy the neighbor's concerns, 
this isn't an application that we're necessarily inclined to, to pursue. So I, I'm not trying to silence anybody tonight. I'm trying to aid the conversation and be a, in a productive manner. Oh, so just to make sure I understand what you're saying here, because there's there's the path. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, the residents are here and we will hear what they have to say. Like that, that what now, what you're, what you're saying is after we hear all this, you are also inclined to, as opposed to going back and forth here, to also meet with them between now and and maybe not go to the next zoning hearing, but pull back and then go to a later zoning hearing after you've all had some time to to work together on concerns and solutions. Then that's that's another component, and we can definitely consider that as well. If that's if that's what you're saying, um, I do respect that the the residents have shown up but we do want to hear what they have to say and then we can kind of talk about some of the other potential next steps if you guys want to take them i appreciate you giving me a chance to speak um so my name is maddie siegfried i am the owner of 431 west market street and uh 432 west market street and 431 wallerton so as such i own the private drive in question that we're talking about um i'm not going to beat a dead horse, there's obviously a lot of concerns about this daycare center. First and foremost, I, I don't wanna live next door to a daycare center, I can say that. Um, that's just me, but um, we we all know, we, we talked a little bit about pick up and drop off. I know that you're proposing a staggered pick up drop off situation. We know real life and the real life is moms and dads are just trying to get their kids to daycare to, to to kindergarten on time, the staggering is is not going to work. And uh, I I already know I already deal with people driving up and down my drive constantly. So the um, the drive unless there's going to be I don't know if in your plan you have a guard that's going to be there you know during drop off and and pick up, but people are going to be parking in the drive because they're running in to drop the kid off. Uh, it's it's the nature of the beast there. Um, I'll be dealing with that forever. Uh, people driving and dr dropping their kids off in, in my drive then. Um, I, I had concerns about the dumpster. Obviously you've addressed that um, and noise. Overall, just um, how it was handled. I, 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 I was on a work trip this morning. I came home so that I could come to this. Um, had I had a little time um, and notice, I mean, I'm, directly behind you guys i i touch your property my property touches your property i just i'm not exactly sure how all of this could have happened without notifying your neighbors uh the only indication that i had that something was happening was that there were stakes uh on the property and and i thought to myself oh the neighbors must be doing something so that was the only indication that i had no notification from my neighbors or the lawyers about any of this um until i got my notification from bernie thanks to that you, Bernie. Um, I'm not gonna speak too long. There's other neighbors here that wanna speak. I, I have legitimate concerns and um, I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, that's for me. Thank you, I appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. Hi, I um, chair the same building as Chris and uh, Shannon. Who are you? Earl Fetzer, uh, 3 South Brandywine is the address. So, my, the back of our property is a part, is a garage. And the garage is, there's an alleyway separating our garage from the uh, daycare, proposed daycare. So, when I spoke, I met Chris when we bought the property six months ago. And um, he mentioned that he was going to have a uh, a uh, rental property, a two-unit rental property. And there, the daycare caught me by surprise. I didn't know that that was in planning. And looking at the schematics, you touched on a lot of the stuff that I wrote down. The the ten kids, uh, no more than ten kids. And when I, when I visualize it in the morning, as far as I, I go further down and I see the parking uh, synopsis of there will be 
no, absolutely no change in the traffic pattern. That, I, that's skeptical to me, how that's possible when there's 10 kids being dropped off and you know, there's, it's a busy market street during the day. So that concerned me. The noise concerned me. The dumpster in the back of the property is right basically in front of our garage, right to the side of it. So that's a concern. Um, other than that, it's pretty much what you guys touched on earlier is concerning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional public? Yep. Okay. Hold, hold on until you get up to the microphone so we can get the recording. This is all a complete shock to me. Okay. Your, your name? My name is Marion Kofo. I'm the president of Hilderburn Muse HOA. Um, the things that have occurred in the last week have been a total shock. I came out into the private drive and found two metal stakes driven into the private drive done by the surveyors for you, I'm supposing. I had no idea. I asked Maddie before we have our general meeting next week if she could clarify what was going on, and she couldn't. So I pro provided this note so you guys know exactly where I stand protecting my homeowners at Hildeburn Muse. As president of Hildeburn Muse Plan Community, my foremost commitment is to uphold the quality of life for all residents and safeguard the value of our properties. It's essential to establish clear measures that protect the privacy and tranquility of our private drive while preserving the scenic beauty of our common area, which is between our sets of homes. The daycare is on our west side of the property. Maddie owns the private drive. We maintain the private drive. That was declared by, decided by the HOA documents when the plan community was established. To ensure the exclusivity of our private drive, we must implement strategies to prevent any unauthorized pedestrians or vehicular traffic, including, included but not limited to children and workers of the daycare. Construction, work, uh, construction vehicles doing work or potential daycare customers and employees sink, seeking those shortcuts to avoid traffic. We have it already from the courthouse. They come and they use our drive as a shortcut. We have children, we have senior citizens, we have grandchildren that live in the community. Anything that would affect that is unfair to what our homeowners deserve. It's concerning. I owned a daycare for 15 years in Westtown Township. It was small, such as yours, and the amount of trash, we went through 40 more than 40 diapers a day. 40 diapers a day being put in trash cans will dramatically affect Maddie being the, the adjoining neighbor. And I'm not sure how you will be able to maintain that if you don't have a dumpster. And how would a dumpster have access? Uh, anybody, the removal company, disposal company, because we only get our trash picked up once a week. There is no way you could have that many diapers sitting for a week and be fair to the residents of Hildebrand Muse. The only thing that we would have to do if it does go through, there would have to be no access to the drive from the daycare. So, and, and like Maddie said, is there a way that she could install security gates that I can't monitor it? I go out and take pictures when the, the, when the, the, the uh, courthouse lets out and watch the speeds and then the quick right turns onto the private drive so they just miss a little bit of traffic. I can't imagine what it'll be for moms and dads that are late for work trying to cut across, use the private drive to go back out Woolerton so they avoid the traffic lights on market. I think we have to be concerned for the quality of life of everybody in Hildebrand Muse, and that's not to say that I don't appreciate what you're trying to do, but there's a lot of considerations that would have to go into having something like this approved. It dramatically affects our quality of life. I want you, I don't know how we go about having a meeting. Nothing was discussed or even presented to us so that we could sort of have a heads up. I was a little frustrated to be honest with you. And so I come and I'm not in a good way with talking about it. Um, it certainly needs a lot of discussion before anything could 
in our opinion, could come to a vote. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any additional public comment? Okay. Um, Mr. Mung. Uh, the Ms. Uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I just do want to say, I, and I think you addressed it as well, um, Marion, uh, that I, 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 I'd like to think that this miscommunication did not come out of like trying to hide something, and I, and, and so please, you know, if as you guys do continue to talk, please keep that in mind that you know everyone's just trying to create a, a great solution for everyone's quality of life, right? Like, so, so just keep that in mind as you continue your conversations and go through this. This may have been a, a mishap and a, a missing communication, but I, I don't think it was out of malice or trying to just like squeeze in a, a quick business without considering all the residents. I think it's learning, learning curve and growing pains, so. I very much appreciate that. I, I agree with that sentiment. It, it's a very public hearing process. I mean, this is just one step and this isn't even a decision making meeting. Um, you know, the, aside from all the public notice and public advertisement with the newspaper and the property posting. Um, yeah, absolutely. We weren't trying to sneak this through. This is a multi month process and I tried to be as transparent as possible, short of speaking directly to the neighbors myself. Um, by attaching the, tra the traffic study, by attaching the impact study. I mean, we've undertaken some serious engineering exercises here by two professional consultants that regularly appear before this borough, and we, we didn't have to attach them. We can present that evidence and testimony at the hearing. I chose to attach them up front to try to give everyone the biggest picture that I could, and I, I realized that we missed the mark with, with the neighbors, and, and I apologize for that, um, but... I, to that point, we're hopeful that we can continue to engage in fruitful dialogue and see where this thing goes. So, so is your proposal still to, to pull back from the, the upcoming hearing, give some time to work with the residents? Um, you can lean on, since you, you're in both wards, you can lean on both Bernie and I to help support these conversations and, and try to come to a solution that works for everyone. And, and really, I mean, that building could be used for something. I mean, it's that, that brown garage building, right? Yeah. It, it, it could be and it, it should be. It, it doesn't look so pretty right now. So something good in there could possibly help the quality of life for everyone too. So. It is admittedly an eyesore, yes. Um, I, I think that we would be willing to pull back here this evening. If, if the three members are in a majority fashion inclined to vote to send the solicitor for purposes of opposition, then yes, absolutely, we wanna pull back and we don't wanna go into a zoning hearing with that mark against us. We'd much rather try to work through the issues. Okay, so what do we, do we vote on them pulling back and going to the, not going to this zoning meeting and going to the next zoning meeting? Is that the, the call to question? <laughs> you could simply table, table the right. agenda item until next month. Okay. That would be my recommendation so. that we table it. On the record, and I'm willing to memorialize this tomorrow, I mean, technically the application needs to be heard by some late date in April. Obviously, April 8th is the, the borough's Zoning Hearing Board's April meeting date. We wouldn't be heard until until May. I'm happy to provide a written extension of time um, tomorrow for the commencement of that hearing. And Mr. Metrics, right? We have, the borough has 60 days to commence the hearing proceedings. So I'm willing to waive that time frame to allow us a chance to take a step back in hopes of moving forward. Great. Do do we do some kind of official vote here, Sean? Sean. Do we need to vote on anything in particular at this table? All right. Thank you guys. Thank everybody, uh, you know, for all your thoughts and that you're going to work together on this. We appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, approved February, 2024 harp submission recommendation. Um, no, we got the other zoning hearing. Sorry. D. No. One. Oh, I missed one. That's right. D. Consider solicitor attendance for zoning appeal 
1008 of 800 New North New Street seeks an extension of variance granted in March 2021 for the correct construction of a garage in the front yard corner of the property. This is an easy one. Um, we don't need to. I'm recommending the committee not send the solicitor to this one. Uh, I learned something looking to this uh, in the borough's code. Your uh, variances expire after 12 months, or if you start and then don't do any work for six months, your variance expires and you got to go get an extension. So the applicant has not um, changed any of their um, plans. They'll just be appearing before the zoning hearing board to. Uh, refresh the decision in order, and it's a building a garage uh, that they weren't able to undertake because they were set back due to conditions of the pandemic, and they had to delay onset of construction. I'm good. You guys are good. Yeah, I'm good. Move to the approved February 2024 Harb submission recommendation. Um, do we do these all together or individually, Sean? Okay. I think most of these are pretty simple, except for the last one, D. All right, well, we'll start with 15 North Walnut Street, Terry Galloway. And. Uh, yep. All right, we're and and so then 17th South Darlington Street, Carol Quigley. Yeah, this the uh, the 17 South Darlington. Uh, the walnut is a is a sign. Um, 17 South Darlington Street is the in, in creation of a new entrance where there is a existing window. Um, Carol Quigley is should name should look familiar because she's on the hard. Um, she did recuse herself from the recommendation just for the record. And, um, I recommend council, um. Approve that, um, certificate of appropriateness, uh, with church street. That is also another sign. Um, as well. Uh, for that business that Arb approved with with some small conditions, and the last one though is a little bit of uh, twenty twenty four oh six for seventeen East Gate Street. Pardon me, I'm ex I'm a little confused why this went to the Harb, because it looks like a uh, platform dining, which we have an entirely different process of approval. I suppose that since it's a new one and they are contemplating a fence, they would need harb approval at some point. But I just want to be clear, we are not approving this dining platform with this action. They have to make a separate application to building and housing that follows our uh, outdoor dining policy amongst. Um, and we can't make a recommendation on approving a dining platform today because um, renewing applicants have to apply by Friday. So we don't know who's renewing and the standards for the outdoor dining platforms only allow two on a block. We currently have three on that block. So I think council kind of, uh, stretched the rules a little bit in the light of the pandemic. Um, so adding a 4th would be something I would want to bring before you all. Uh, and I will reach out to the applicant to submit an application once we know it. Once we know uh, who is and isn't renewing for 2024, we won't know that till Monday. Well, and I, and I emailed you, I was a little confused because as far as I know, there's no restaurant in that building or restaurant application for that building. So what, what's, what are, are they, is that for that building or is it for next door and they're just extending it in front of that building? Like, um, it's for that building. I think it's on the application. I don't know. The name uh, it's on the application who is. Applying for this. Yeah, we'll get you an answer on this 1, but I Maggie and Maggie, I'll see there. There it is. So, um. 
I don't know what that is. Um, it would have to be a food business. Correct. Yeah. The application says 17, 16 Z, yeah. the driveway. Yeah. 17. Well, we'll get the side of the street correct. Either yeah, one, it's actually seven, 17 because it's right in front of the old classic diner. And it looks like to me what they're trying to do is fill in the uh, the bump in on purpose. That's all you can only do that in a for a dining platform for food use. Yeah, so uh, is that going to be a permanent patio they're, they're asking for? No, they expect it to be temporary, but we need to clarify what use yeah. it is. The only thing they have done is gone to the harb and said, should we do this? Is the fence and treatment that we've proposed okay with the historic guidelines for the district, okay. yeah. which the harb says it is? This is not granting them permission to actually do this yet, and I'll make that very clear. The sidebar does have those fencing right next door, and that was always a parking spot there. Uh, no one, ever, my daughter was too cheap to uh, pay the 20,000 to fill it in. So she just put her tables in the, uh, the bump in, but it looks like they want to put another table, you know, in there. Okay. So at this point, we're saying that we recommend A, B, and C, but not D. I, I would table D until we get clarification with the applicant that on what actually is going on here. Okay, you guys are good with that. Yep. Okay. All right. Motion to schedule a hearing on May 15th, 2024 at 6 30 p.m. for short term rental ordinance. The draft that the solicitor prepared is faithful to the conversation we had with uh, council at the work session or at the voting session in February. Um, went back and I listened to the recording. I do want to stress or point out to the members of council that uh, what this contemplates is a conditional use process for approval. That's a permitted use. It's just a different process that the applicant would have to go to get approval. They would have to appear before borough council to get that approval. Uh, there would be um, a court reporter taking testimony. It would look a lot like a zoning hearing. Um, however, it would function kind of like a Council hearing, uh, which has a different flavor to it. More people come. There's more voices and decision makers in the room. Conditional use process is typically reserved for very impactful things that happen in a municipality or things that are really unusual that you're permitting in a certain district. Um, and there aren't that many conditional uses on your books right now in the borough. I just did a quick look uh, at your code. at our code. And uh, in the town center, uh, your, uh, the borough permits automotive sales, clubs, lodges, and indoor theaters as conditional use. And in the mixed use district, agricultural retail stores and shops, student home reconstruction. So all told, there's maybe um, uh, seven conditional uses all in the entire borough, seven kinds of uses that are approved by conditional use process. So what you will have is a new recurring event for council, which are hearings to authorize um, short-term rentals, should you go with this conditional use route. And it, it's a strict way to do it. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's how it's gonna play out. Does, does anyone have any comment? Or you guys are good. Yeah. I'm good. I think I think giving the little extra hoop to jump through or something actually makes sure that you know we're not that that we're actually putting the right pieces in the right place or the the right businesses in the right place. Lisa, you look like you're contemplating. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what's running through my head is, you know, what we just experienced with 330 and the daycare and the obligation of council to approve something once it's hit a certain milestone. I, I, I'd like to understand that better so that we really do have the opportunity to approve or deny 
these applications. So I guess the question is, is there different, Sean, you explained to me there's three different processes that could happen. Conditional use, um, oh shoot, now I forget, I had them more, no. Yeah, there's uh, use process. by special exception and there's by right use. If you, if you walk in the door and your application is completely um, compliant with, with, uh, with zoning, the zoning officer has the authority to issue the zoning permit by right. Um, something that needs a permitted use that needs to be approved by special exception typically has, um, and uh, Mr. Jennings was correct, very art very narrowly articulated bars that the application has to meet, and they go to the zoning hearing board and they testify to those eight, ten, or six, or however many things they are, and the zoning hearing board makes a very almost non-discretionary ruling on whether they met those standards, and then attaches reasonable conditions of approval. And that's special exception. That's kind of the medium difficulty route to approval. Conditional use is the hardest because you have to come and talk to council and there's seven of you. And um, it's a council hearing and, and more people come to council hearings, more people speak freely at council hearings. And um, But it works out the same way. Council can uh, attach reasonable conditions of approval when it grants a conditional use but it, it's a legislative process that takes place. Does that make you feel a little better? Okay, good. All right. All right. So I think that- We had a lot of solicitors in the room tonight telling us what we had to do. <laughs> They're just doing their job. All right. So I guess we're all good on that one. So the next one, motion to approve December and February, December, 2023 and February, 2024 smart growth committee meeting minutes. That's the easiest one. All right. It is. Wait a minute. Cause that clock is not right yet. 743 and this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>